Hello and welcome to the Mobile Game Dev Playbook. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. This is a podcast all about what makes a great mobile game, what is and isn't working for mobile game designers and all the latest trends. I'm your host, John Jordan, and uh, joining me today in this episode to talk about live ops and seasonal events and collaborations and all such sort of uh, mashups, uh, we have our two experts. So uh, first up, we have uh, Calais Helkinen, who is a senior game analyst at the Game Refinery by Bungle, uh, expert in particularly the Chinese market. How's it going, Calais? Very good. Thanks for asking. How about you? Good. We're all getting ready for seasonal things. We're, we're in the particularly seasonal part of the year, so I think it's going to be a good episode looking at those sort of things. And uh, also joining us, we have uh, Wilhelm Voltalainen, who's a senior game analyst, also at Game Refinery by Vungle, and a particular expert on the uh, US market. How's it going, Wilhelm? Yeah, I'm doing really well. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Good. So uh, we're going to we're going to kind of cover a bit of ground. We're going to look at, I guess, generally this is seen as sort of live live operations. How these uh, mobile games that have been going for now, you know, maybe up to a decade, how they're keeping their audiences sort of reengaged and, and coming back, and, and, and special events are, are a massive part of that. And I guess particularly, um, as, as we say, kind of seasonal events are, are a really good way of sort of uh, getting kind of these fantasy game worlds in some cases sort of linked into the real world and getting people sort of excited about these things. So um, we're going to talk a bit about, I guess, about the difference between sort of Asia and, and the West, but you're going to sort of, you're going to sort of kick us off talking about the kind of Western markets and, and how sort of seasonal events sort of are, are playing into that and what's going on in the market at the moment. Yeah. So in the, in the, in the Western market, of course, nowadays talking about seasonal events, well, first of all, they are have been they are currently extremely popular. I think about ninety percent of top crossing one hundred games in the U.S. utilize some kind of seasonal events. Uh, and and also looking at sort of what kind of different, of course, because there's a lot of different kind of seasonal events you can use Christmas, New Year, and so on. But many of these top crossing games actually uh, take the opportunity to utilize almost all of these bigger seasonal events. So they have events for Christmas, events for Halloween, for summer, and, and so on. And we have also been seeing uh, sort of huge, huge rise in, in, in the smaller uh, events as well. For example, like October fests, midsummer, and, and, and so on. And they are, the, especially the smaller events have been like gaining popularity each year. And uh, then when looking at the sort of the event structure and what kind of the event, the seasonal events usually actually are, well, they have been varying from all the way from just small UI uh, team changes. You know, you have a seasonal team in the UI, uh, limited time EAP offers, all the way from that to like this huge, fully fledged uh, events with special tasks, uh, event currencies, uh, limited time content like uh, seasonal game modes, or, or and, and of course, uh, Pretty much always, when there's a bigger event, you have these exclusive seasonal themed rewards. Uh, but nowadays, I think one of the, also one of the biggest trends in terms of seasonal events, and I think in terms of the bigger events in general, uh, has actually been that they are, have been sort of utilizing this same kind of event framework uh, throughout the whole year for all the events. Uh, Basically, just you, you know, you have the usual mechanics in the in the event, and then they just change the skin from, uh, let's say, the Christmas event, and then you have Easter event, and it's basically the same event, just new rewards and new team, and maybe new story elements and so on. Uh, and I think this is actually quite clever way in the terms. Of course, it's. Uh, event event rules and everything is already familiar familiar to the player, but it's also uh, because of course there's live op live ops and, and 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 running as much events as, as possible has been like really proven uh, and working way in, in in mobile the mobile games. So as of course there's also limitations with live ops. So this is a really clever way to en enable this utilization of of multiple, if not every single seasonal event there is. So some good points there. Okay, I guess the first one was, I mean, you know, if 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 I'm surprised, it's only ninety percent of the top one hundred grossing games are using seasonal events. I'm trying to, trying to I'm trying to think what what would be the games that 
wouldn't use seasonal events. I don't know <laughs> what, why, why would you not, why would you not do this? It's kind of a sort of surprising that you would ha- have a, this, a successful game that isn't using, isn't using these in some ways, I guess, I guess there could be some reasons. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if there's anything off the top of your head, um, why you wouldn't do that. Assuming the games are using seasonal events, it is say, it's sort of interesting that, that games have, uh, you know, live ops is basically always, always having something new in the game, isn't it? So, some of those things will be seasonal events. Some of those things will just be sort of the sort of the uh, cadence of the sort of the game, and you have sort of new new sort of character drops, which have nothing to do with what's going on in the real world. Um, but but I guess it's as you, as you say, it's the, you, you always want something new happening, and and so the live ops team sort of gets that framework in, and then the, to a degree, it's sort of putting in skins. Uh, but in some ways, it can be sort of bigger things. Do you think there can be too much live ops? I mean, can because it there is this idea that. You, know, you you always want sort of some new things in there, so people are not feeling like the game's going stale. There's always sort of there's the game they're playing and the meta they're doing in the game, and then there's these new things. Can it be too confusing? Do you think if we if we have too much going on, you sort of load the game and just like whoa, what's it? every time you sort of like trying to work out what the new thing is? Yeah, I think definitely it can be uh, confusing and and maybe. Uh, maybe the sort of synergies are not there if it is, there's too many events happening exact, exactly at the same time. But I think what's like really important, and even in the casual genres, there is, I think the most important point that there is some kind of event um, almost always going on. Just, you don't, that they don't overlap too much. I think that's the important thing you have to <laughs> remember. Yeah, for for certain, you know, players, if they might might get overly stressed if they, especially those completionists, if they're not able to, you know, complete all the event content that is available in the in the, in the game, and there's uh, too much of the event stuff to do, and and you know they get anxious about not being able to, you know, just experiencing all the content and getting, for example, all the limited time items or characters or character skins that would be available to get. So I can definitely think that for certain players it might even uh you know uh sort of being a be a stressful thing to to have i agree what's also interesting is obviously games are global and even if some games have, have mainly have a sort of a, a a geographical sort of a popularity you know most games are played globally now um and i guess it is interesting to see that there are probably some um some seasonal events that probably do work globally better than others i mean i guess sort of sort of christmas or a holiday season around in december sort of roughly works globally because you know obviously west west we have it and in china you sort of have it new year sort of a bit into january but we have that sort of month period where it's sort of everyone celebrates that sort of thing so that's kind of quite a good one um i wonder the other one i was thinking of was i don't know how globally it is maybe you can uh, talk about this kind of calais halloween really seems to be one that sort of culturally is now you know very very sort of strong and it sort of plays it's quite I think it's sort of plays in quite well with games, doesn't it? Lots of games would, ha- you know, Halloween would be something that they would sort of pick up upon. It's, you know, it, it sort of seems like a very if you if if game developers were going to invent a sort of seasonal um, a, a seasonal uh, thing, Halloween would probably be the one they would go for because it has, you know, everyone immediately sort of knows what it is. Do they, is that very strong in Asia, Halloween? Um, like in, in in general, Halloween actually is a sort of a thing in 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 Japan. Like if we discuss out, uh, like even outside games um it's a huge thing if you are you happen to be for example in tokyo during during halloween times so, there's you know everyone you know wears a costume and and goes outside to party on 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 halloween so it's definitely a huge thing uh and uh in terms of uh games i'm i believe it's utilized up to some extent but i would still say that in these asian markets for example japan and china uh, the most important seasonal events that you see in the games uh, are the local ones. Obviously, there are some some events that uh, are more sort of uh, have a more global uh, reach. Uh, Halloween is probably one of them. Yeah, for uh, for sure. But like, if we are thinking about the biggest events, then um, they would probably be some of the ones that uh, we are. Uh, actually, not that familiar in the West, but uh, but yeah, I guess I'll I'll discuss them in the, in the later on. And I guess it kind of equally it is um, over time. Um, if it's sort of particularly if they're games that are developed in Asia, then when they're doing their sort of big seasonal events, that sort of leaks into the Western audience, and we start to learn a bit more about sort of um, sort of those cultures and, and the sort of uh, the things that are important to them, which is obviously also also interesting. 
Yeah, that's um, that's true. Yeah, that's actually something that we have noticed as well. Like like when we are you know comparing the games in the in the Asian markets and in the Western markets. So like our Western analysts have been like sometimes saying that hey, we have these you know Lunar New Year events in in Western games as well. So yeah, true. I suppose it isn't. No, I mean just on a very su- superficial level, it is you know. If you have any Chinese audience, the Chinese New Year, there will be, you know, the year of whatever animal it is will be something that will be, you know, will be seen as quite common for you to sort of reflect in, in, in the game, wouldn't it? Um, so uh, um, what do we think about things like kind of, uh, you mentioned it there, um, Wilhelm, like, like Oktoberfest, which is quite, a, I mean, obviously in the West, I suppose, in, in Europe, we've seen sort of that spread over time and people people have this, you know, this sort of idea of sort of German beer and sausage sort of month or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it, it, can we have events that that are just they're sort of they're all, they're sort of too too sort of small in audience that or is you know is Oktoberfest something that, you know is that actually quite a good one because even if you don't know what Oktoberfest is if you're in Australia it doesn't really matter you can sort of you can sort of understand it. it's just an in-game event around something and it doesn't really matter do, do these events need to have some sort of resonance for the audience do you think well I think for example if let's say let's say you have a, g- a game that has to have you want to have event every single month and 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 during uh during the october first i think just before halloween you think okay what kind of event do we have do we want to have uh, what kind of team do we want to have to uh, uh, for our event this month well you can have of course some you can come up with some kind of event team from your game but i, I think like you utilizing of course not everybody is like super familiar what october first is but like I think most people have still heard about it. So seeing some kind of familiar Oktoberfest in your game, I think that's something that the games have been like utilizing a lot. Talking about like Oktoberfest and these smaller, smaller, more specific events. And of course they are for for, for smaller uh, seasonal events like, like the Oktoberfest, that really isn't usually like this sort of anything super new in the game. It's just that, you know, the Oktoberfest skin on top of the your usual monthly event with some Oktoberfest themed uh, rewards and so on. But yeah, that's actually been really popular, the Oktoberfest as well, all around the games. I so, say so one thing that does sort of, um, I have noticed in games, particularly around Christmas, where, you know, they generally, I, yeah, I guess, sort of mid, mid, mid December, you sort of, um, in the game, you sort of uh, maybe have sort of, on the main menu, there sort of it gets a snow a snow theme or, or something, or you know, um, sort of red Santa Claus hats and stuff. But I have found in, in sort of in previous years that they, while, while games are sort of quite keen on sort of getting in early to these these big seasonal events, they tend to they, they can still be like in mid January, and you're still in sort of Christmas theme, which which maybe it's just sort of my personal thing. I always kind of think, oh, that's uh, you know, that, that that seems like they they just don't. They've, they've forgotten to sort of update the game, and they're, you know, they're, we're still, you know, <laughs> we're on the fifteenth of, of, of January, and everyone's like, "Oh, it's a new year," and, and, and we're still on, on Christmas theme. So, um, do, do, is that something sort of you notice? I mean, how 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 quickly should sort, sort of the, do you think these things? Because um, because I guess they do because if you haven't been there too long, they sort of become the opposite of what they're supposed to be, which is keeping the game fresh. They sort of become. You know, oh, it's they're a bit tired that we, you know, everyone's given everyone stopped Christmas and in, in the game it's still Christmas. Yeah, well, I, I actually I think after like of course there's there's pretty much every game has some kind of Christmas themed event that are running events. Then you of course you have the you have the New Year, but usually after that they actually <laughs> for the January there I think the most common um, seasonal event is, is this kind of winter winter event. So I think that's like that usually what the what the games do in the West. They can keep the snow and just take away the um the, the Santa Claus hat. Maybe maybe exactly. that's the, maybe that's the compromise. Um so uh, we talked a bit about kind of, kind of seasonal events uh in the West. We'll, we'll talk about China later. Um the other sort of thing which is sort of linked um I guess in terms of live ops things is this we're seeing increasing amounts of collaboration and, and those are um collaborations between brands uh, typically and, and and often I guess they are the ones that come to my mind, at least, are collaborations between sort of games and and non gaming brands. And, and clearly, as games get bigger, um, and as as brands sort of want to market to those audiences, we, we're seeing a lot more of that. So, so um, what sort of trends do you see um, um, uh, from that? Yeah, of course. Well, like the first trend is, of course, the collaboration itself uh, <laughs> becoming extremely popular, popular, especially in this game that that have really heavy live ops. In the in the mid core mid core category, for example, 
but like some some really good examples, I think uh, from of course it really depends on the game, what kind of the event is, and and and, and they collaborate, what, what sort of brands they collaborate with. But for example, one of the like the biggest sort of uh, collaboration, the biggest games that use. Uh, collaborations is Roblox. I think that's like really good example uh, for their events. I think most of the like nine out of the ten different events that they run in the game are some kind of collaborations. For example, just they just had collaboration with uh, they had they, they, well they have had actually these concert events quite often now where where uh, different uh, artists sort of do their uh, album releases inside the Roblox uh, in, in this virtual experience. So they just they just had one with the 21 pilots. And of course, bef before that, they've had uh, with Sarah Larson and, 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 and Lil, and Lil Nas X also. But, but on top of that, they, while they had the sort of the 20 by 21 pilots uh, experience, they also had at the same time, they did it with the collaboration with Vans. <laughs> so whole, whole another collaboration. So what they did actually that uh, they, they created this Vans, huge Vans uh, game inside Roblox, where it's got, you, you get this sort of Tony Hawk pro skater feeling because it's basically a hangout social area where players can skate. It's, it's basically a permanent game in, inside Roblox with the, with the Vans team and players can purchase Vans items and, and, and skateboards and, and, and what else to, to their character. So those are like really good examples. And also, uh, actually, um, um, MOBA called Mobile Against Bang Bang. We have actually seen because well, I could talk about this, go, go really deep about this, but like uh, MOBAs are probably one of the hardest, uh, hardest uh, genres to monetize because they have to rely he really heavily to, uh, on, the, on the cosmetic economies to avoid pay to win. So how, what, how mobile against Bang Bang has actually been able to monetize extremely well is through these collaboration events. They basically, they just had, for example, collaboration event with Transformers, where, where basically there was like this super cool exclusive skins that player could use for their favorite heroes, uh, like Optimus Prime and 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 those, <laughs> and and how players could get them is that basically through these special gotchas. But those th those are basically like there's there's so much possibilities in in utilizing collaboration events. The, the, I think that like the exclusive characters are just one like extremely good example. Again, it sort of comes back to what we were discussing with the live ops things. Is is I, I guess it's kind of finding the balance of if if like every week there's a new collaboration, then it's sort of like pff, yeah, you, you sort of quickly they're not they're not sort of special. And obviously, some collaborations are just with bigger brands than others. So it's sort of an interesting um, sort of kind of cadence how you how you play that out. Because um, because yeah, it's, it's and again, it's kind of a Going back to what you said, Calais, a little bit. If, if you have if you have completists and you have sort of too many collaborations and they sort of feel like they're they're just being oh I've got to spend more money to get me to sort of get these things. And it's, so it's, again, it's a sort of difficult balancing act. The Roblox one, I guess, is easier because because it is just is you know an event, a huge metaverse game. Yeah, yeah and, and, and events are just kind of you know obviously you're not paying for anything. You're just sort of mm -hmm. turning up to do it, and there may be there may be um, kind of. Uh, things to buy around that but the, the reason you're going for, for that and, and, and the, you know the ones in, in Fortnite is is um is because you're there and it's sort of, sort of the the live experience which is um yeah which is I guess a kind of interesting almost like in between collaboration and and seasonal thing I mean the seats not seasonal in that sense but it's sort of live live events in games and I guess um not not most games can't sort of sustain that technically but I guess over time we'll see more and more of that sort of um that you know that sort of uh, appointment gaming or whatever, whatever term we want to use, where, where you just you, know, you get all your audience in to, to, to see this kind of kind of kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good point, and and like I would argue that that the, the collaboration events like uh, uh, they work work better in some games and 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 worse in some some other games, but especially like in those games like Fortnite and Roblox, which are these like these social hangout things are a very big part of the the overall experience. And then that, you know, enables you to create this huge hype with, for example, with the concerts and, uh, and the stuff that you have uh, coming up with the collaboration events. So uh, I think like they've been very clever with utilizing uh, collaborations with the sort of the, the game modes and the, the game mechanics that they, they have in these types of uh, 
in these types of games. And I think it was a very good point, John, that you mentioned the seasonality of things because I, I think that uh, these games are also utilizing that uh, up to some extent. For example, the Fortnite just had the uh, Ariana Grande thing, and it was actually something that lasted for several different weeks that had several different phases for... So in phase one, you had these quests. In phase two, you had these quests. So it was almost like a like a multiple week extravaganza uh, with uh, with the Ariana Grande uh, event. But that was, that was so elaborate, wasn't it? I mean, just you say the build up to it, and then the actual event itself was. I mean, there, there's probably only a handful of companies in the world, even if they had this sort of game in which you could do that event, who would be able to sort of spend the resources. I mean, I don't know how many people they've had working on that, but clearly, you know, you're sort of building building a fairly substantial game within a game. To, to, so so um, I wonder if it's sort of... And, and then the problem for them, I guess, becomes the next sort of a big event they do is sort of, well, we did that last time. How are you going to better it? It almost becomes diminishing returns that you're putting so much resources into these completely over-the-top experiences, which are fantastic. Um, but but how, how do you sort of do it? How do you do that in a without sort of a competing with yourself every time? You know, how can you do that in a way which sort of fulfills the sort of uh, excitement and the desires of your audience, but doesn't totally blow your budget? I mean, I suppose Epic don't really care. That's sort of part of the thing of of Epic saying, you know, we, we are we are the sort of top uh, top developer for, for lots of reasons um, in this space. So so maybe they don't care less about it. But I guess for 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 more, I guess what we kind of think about in these sort of podcasts is is just for. You know, just general game developers who don't necessarily don't have a lot of resources. They're thinking about how, you know, I've got a certain amount of resource. Where do I place that? It's, it's sort of, you know, finding finding a balance between these enormous great events. Um, yeah, I think well, we already talked about the utilizing the same event framework. I think for especially for smaller smaller uh, developers, I think that's <laughs> definitely one of the best ways to best ways to do it if you want to have as many different events as you want uh, as you can. Yeah, and, and uh, to add to that, not not all the collaboration events have to be, you know, Ariana Grande concerts. They can be much smaller scale ones as well. Like we've seen just events where you have some special character skins from certain uh, external IP and stuff like that, and, and they can work as well. And I guess, you know, at, at the smaller level, what's, and even at the big level, particularly on the smaller level, is, is it's kind of thinking about, you know, you, you're not going to get the very, you know, you, you know, you haven't got the funds to, to do these very big deals, but this. But, you know, effectively, sort of everything is a brand now, isn't it? I mean, if you're in sort of, I don't know, trying to, you know if you're in clothing or, or kind of, um, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, trainers or, or, or fitness or, you know, every, and obviously with with the influence as well. So everything is a brand now. Um, so it's sort of, sort of, I guess, finding a sort of brand that, you know, you can sort of, you can work with on a good basis and sort of in some way appeals to your audience. And and um and I guess maybe the interesting thing now for, for some of the smaller games is, is sort of actually t- working with a small brand, but sort of getting a collaboration that sort of builds up. So you, if it's with a band or something like that, you're a small band and you're, you're sort of bringing them to your audience. They, they're enjoying it. You're doing more of it. The band gets bigger. You sort of get bigger. And, and that's actually quite a, and that's much harder work than just sort of dropping millions of dollars to, to get a big artist in, in, into your game. But, but, um, but that's an interesting sort of part of the wider sort of marketing that, that, that games it you know, should be doing at uh, all times, isn't it? Really, so we're, we're gonna, yeah, lots of lots of uh, lots of opportunities there. Um, Kelly, do you want to talk us a, li- a little bit about about the sort of Asian market um, and and how this is going? Because the collaborations are, uh, I guess, on a really on a different level, um, particularly in places like Japan, where they have so many of these sort of uh, brands. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think we can start with uh, the collaborations. So um, we already. Uh, mentioned that they are big in the West, but they are obviously very big in, in Asia. And, and some someone could argue that sort of the origin of, of collaboration events is actually in, in, in Japan. Um, just look at, I just looked at uh, our data and uh, collaboration events in the top 100, among top 100, top 100 crossing games are utilized in 50% of the games in China and in 65% of games in Japan. So very, very, Big in, in in Japan. Didn't look at the the number for for West, but I believe that it's not that far away in the West as uh, as well currently. But yeah, in Japan, it's it's like it's very common to you know have it's like you can have one IP uh, to appear in multiple different types of games. So uh, one that is very popular is, for example, the Persona uh, gaming franchise. And then when it comes to 
obviously there's numerous numerous uh, manga fra- IPs, manga franchises that appear in 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 Japanese uh, RPGs. But one that just uh, caught my eye is the Attack on uh, Titan. Uh, because it just has just appeared in so many different games. It is uh, like I have. Uh, this, this is just a list of some of the games that our Japanese analysts have have seen the the Attack on Titan IP, and I can see eleven top two hundred crossing games that you know have had some sort of Attack on Titan collaboration event in them, including Knives Out and Monster Strike, uh, for example. So collaborations are big in Japan, but they are big in China uh, as well. And in, in terms of China, one thing that I, I need to mention here is, is KFC. So Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, wouldn't probably be the first one to come to your mind when you think about which brand uh, would be a very suitable fit for a collaboration event in, in a mobile game. But uh, like uh, after, like I don't know, the fifth or sixth or the seventh collaboration event, like we were like, okay. Uh, it looks like this is the, this is the the, the IP that uh, every single Chinese games want to have in their in their sort of event portfolio. So um, just uh, like giving you some examples of games, uh, Moonlight Blade, which is very very popular MMO uh, in in China, they had a KFC collaboration event where fans of the game could purchase a KFC meal. You know. The, a real KFC meal in a real KFC restaurant, and then through that get some in-game items uh, in the Moonlight Blade game, including some KFC-themed uh, cosmetic items. So uh, for all the KFC fans, they can you know uh, show them show those off in the game as well. Uh, then in also a very popular RPG game called On Myoji, uh, they utilize actually location-based technology. Uh, in the in the event, so uh, they incorporated five thousand different KFC locations uh, in this event. So players could look up in the game uh, that th- those different KFC locations, go to those low uh, KFC restaurants, and then in those restaurants, or I believe like in the near vicinity of those restaurants, they could then battle uh, some specific uh, special. Uh, Onmyoji monster enemies, monster ghosts, uh, and then through that get various kinds of uh, rewards. And they could also invite their friends to fight these ghosts uh, uh, as well. And then maybe the third one to mention here is Genshin Impact. That's a game that is probably familiar to everyone in the West as well. Um, so they had just, you know, branded meals, uh, limited time Diluc. So Diluc is a character in Genshin Impact. Had the Diluc branded uh, buckets that you could buy in KFC tor- uh, stores, and uh, and they were branded with uh, uh, with uh, famous red and white colored wings from the from the uh, Genshin uh, uh, franchise. So, so that that that's been something that's been really interesting to follow in the in the uh, in the in the sort of Chinese collaboration scene. I guess it's it's interesting that because. That's not really from the examples you were giving. It that's more sort of using the game to drive kind of you know kind of real world activity to drive people to buy you know, KFC stuff rather than uh, it doesn't it doesn't seem like because obviously you know what what KFC item would you have in the game because a lot of the collaborations now around sort of fashion and stuff are about having in game items that are uh, you know the digital representation of the real life thing. And I guess for most games having a bucket of Ken, Kentucky Fried Chicken in the game doesn't make it really doesn't make any sense. So, so the fact that the, the the brand is actually really sort of loose, you know, it's, it's a very sort of loose thing in the game. It's not really in, not really impacting in the game, but it's driving sort of gamers in to, to change their real their real world behavior, which is kind of like I guess the opposite of a lot of the collaborations that we're seeing. Yeah, I, I guess it goes both ways. Assuming, yeah. So I think there's like positive synergies to to both you know both parties. So for the the, the IP that wants to co- you know collaborate, obviously there's you know they get more brand outreach in the in the in the game, and then also the the uh, the the game gets more visibility in the in the for example in the KFC store. So uh, yeah, I guess it's a it's a win win for both sides. And it just sort of when you said that it reminded me that um, KFC had that crazy um, they called it the cooler or something, didn't they? They 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 did this big. Uh... I don't know if it was, a, it was just a meme thing, but they did a a, a a PC built into a some sort of KFC 
I think it was a fridge or something. It was some really weird, I need to check it up. It was some really weird thing that they did about a year ago. I, I have a I, I have a recollection of that one as well. But uh, yeah, I, don't, I didn't didn't know KFC was so big in China on those weird things. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would assume that one of their biggest markets, probably. Yeah. But yeah, on on maybe I'll just continue a bit on the sort of Asian uh, seasonal events uh, as 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 well. So it like I mentioned in the beginning. So um, China and Japan they have their own seasonal stuff and own uh, event thing like events related. To, uh, content that is very popular in this uh, in these mar- markets, and there it's somewhat pop- uh, somewhat different than in the in the West. Maybe a couple of highlights to throw out here is that um, in China you have the Singles Day that happens on 11th of, of November. I think it's getting re- relatively popular here in the West as well. Uh, at least here in Finland, you can see you know it appearing in in you know like big stores advertising it. But anyway, in China, it's, it's huge. It's, you know, it's the Black Friday in, in, in China. Uh, so all kinds of promotions, like in thinking, think about mobile games, uh, what you see during, during um, the singles days that you have these huge, you know, promotions, bundles, discounts. So if ever there's a time to think about making, uh, you know, attractive promotions or offers or bundles, then, then that's, that's definitely the, the, the day to, to do that. Then there's the Chinese New Year that we discussed uh, already. I think one thing to mention about that is that because it's such a long holiday, so in mobile games, what we see is that the Chinese New Year events, there's there's multiple different sort of stages to the event, how they roll out. So in in week one, they roll out these things. And then in week two, they roll out these next couple of uh, sub events or stuff like that, and, and and so on. So, so that's something that they that they clearly clearly do. And then one one specific thing uh, is the red envelopes that you see in the games. I think you, we see in the uh, them in the West as well, right, Wilhelm? So, like yeah, I during think during the Lunar New Year events, yeah. at least. So the idea is that you like the the original idea is that you give your friends or relatives these red envelopes. They always contain. Uh, money and in games obviously you can also you know you know give in-game currencies to to your fame and uh, your your friends and, and stuff like that so that's that's utilized this, uh, as well um and then some other big festivals may the may celebrations and then the mid-autumn festival is actually going on right now uh is very very big and then there's in in june there's dragon ball uh festival and maybe one thing to mention about that is that you have Always, the the sort of the limited time currencies are in the form of a zongzi, and I can perhaps zongzi is a term that doesn't ring any bells to anyone listening to this uh, podcast, but it's a traditional Chinese rice dish made of this sort of a uh, glutinous rice stuffed with different fillings, uh, and it's this green triangle things that you see uh, in all the mobile games during Dragon Ball uh, Festival. So um, so whenever the Dragon Ball Festival is coming up, what you see in mobile games is this songs uh, limited time currency. So so for all the sort of Western developers going to China, if you are doing Dragon Ball Post Festival uh, limited time currencies, remember to put the songs uh, in there. And then just a couple of pointers in Japan. In Japan, you have these June brides in in June. So the June pride concept, uh, it's it said that you know, couples who marry during uh, the, the the month of June, they will live happily ever after. Uh, so during that month, games are also filled with you know special versions of characters that wear bridal dresses or or, or if they're male, then tuxedos and, uh, and 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 stuff like that. And if it's it's a game that revolves around romance or proposal themes, then you have these special storylines that are themed around you know flowers and women with rings in their hands and and and, and beautiful brides and, and and stuff like that. And then what maybe one other thing to mention is the beach themed events during summertime in Japan. So summers in Japan are very hot. Uh, and this, you know, July and August especially, so that's also a typical time to take a break from school. And that's something that can be seen in games interfaces as well. It's typical for the characters to wear beach attire during, you know, summer events. And and you often see special limited time um, versions of, you know, character skins for 
wearing, you know, beach outfits and stuff like that. So that's something to take a note of if you are in the Japanese market and and uh, are thinking about what kind of limited time content to have during the summertime. So uh, no, it's, it's good. I mean, it's good to know that they that the there are a lot of these things which which um which are obscure. I guess we're not getting too globalized that everything is is uh is, is popular everywhere because there's just too many festivals so um yeah it's, it's sort of um the, the dragon boat one's interesting that people so so for that one they actually create um specific specific currencies just for those events so it'd be a new currency yeah well that's that's actually a pretty common thing to do uh like one of the sort of elements that you do in live events that you have you know own live event economy and in that economy you have a limited time shop and limited time time currency so that's that's not nothing extraordinary but then during that time of the year the limited time currency so it's not going to be in in halloween it would be pumpkins for example but in this during those events it would be those uh you know those zongzi things yeah. excellent so uh i think i think we we will we've probably done seasonality for <laughs> for uh, for this year at least um i hope that's that has been useful for, for people i guess um there are always sort of interesting sort of granularities you can find and, and i guess um while there are these big ones sort of sort of these, these big seasonal events that everyone um celebrates i i, I think with some of the stuff we sort of pointed out is is you kind of you need to find out what is interesting for your audience whether that sort of um you know could do very local seasonal stuff if you have a very local audience or and certainly when it comes to collaborations finding out which are the sort of the best collaborations um for your audience and 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 finding out sort of what your audience likes or what your audience wants to know more about if it's if it's if you're trying to kind of work with with uh, with smaller brands but anyway thank you uh very much uh calais and thank you very much uh, wilhelm for your expertise thank you thank you thank you for listening and and watching we're available through the usual audio podcast channels and and also video as well so um we hope you're enjoying the uh the, the uh, podcast or the video cast uh, please if you are do give us uh, some feedback um some some uh uh, on the, particularly on the on the podcast side if you give us some reviews that, that will be uh, really great helps other people find uh, the podcast as well and uh, don't forget to come back uh, next time we are regularly looking into the world of mobile games and seeing what is going on there. there's always um, loads of interesting stuff to to delve into so i hope you're enjoying it um, come back next time and see you then <laughs>